Welcome to the Theology Mom podcast with Krista Bontrager. In this special edition, we're presenting a replay from the Filter It Through a Brain Cell podcast with Kathy Gibbons. In the interview, Krista defines social justice and how Christians should think about this complicated topic. And now, here's Kathy Gibbons interviewing Krista. I wanted to interview Krista Bontrager to talk about one of the terms that we're hearing a lot about in culture these days, and that is the term justice, or as you may have heard it, social justice. So this term has been used to make people feel validated, make people feel entitled, make people feel guilty, make public policy and make societal change. But what is it? (laughs) What is it really? And is the way it's being used really accurate? What is the truth about justice and how can we know? These are all things that we're going to be talking to Krista about today. So Krista Bontrager is a fourth generation Bible teacher. She's an author, a podcaster, and a former university professor. Krista has unique ability to connect theology with real life, which is why I asked her to come on to talk about this topic today. So Krista has worked professionally in theology and apologetics for 25 years and transitioned into full-time ministry with the Center for Biblical Unity in 2021. So she is committed to equipping Christians to properly interpret the Bible and apply scripture to contemporary social issues. And you can find her at theologymom.com. So I'm excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Let's dive in. Well, hello, Krista. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Glad to be here. So I'm super excited to talk about this topic. You know, my audience are uh, teenagers and their families, and they've been learning critical thinking, and they've been learning how to apply it now. So we've learned some skills of thinking and of good thinking, but now let's apply it to what we're being told in culture. Because as we look around in culture, we are getting all these messages about very interesting things. And I think every generation has its own little topics and buzzwords. And maybe every decade, it seems like it changes a little bit. But this is the world that these kids are growing up in right now. And so I really want to equip them to think well about these messages and about these words that are confusing. Quite frankly, they're confusing. This whole, you know, obviously we're talking about justice today and how to think about justice. And so I think a really great place to start is to be, let's just define our terms. So what is justice? Or I will say it this way, because this is kind of how we are hearing it. What is social justice? Because that's the word that we're, the phrase that we're getting in culture. Yeah, for sure. And social justice, I, I think it's important for us to define our terms. So I'm going to use the phrase social justice, and then I'm going to use the phrase biblical justice, which really biblical justice is just justice, but we'll get into that. Um, So social justice is a very confusing term that started out as a Christian idea, but has been completely hijacked by the world in most cases and has come to mean something completely different than the original meaning in the Bible. And so that's what Mm. all of us need to keep in mind is they're using a term from the Bible, but then twisting the definition of it. And that's why it's so confusing. I think that that we call this maybe the equivocation fallacy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that's what's happening on the issue of justice. So when you hear the word justice or social justice, that's the time you need to get your thinking cap on. It's a lot of pretty nice sounding words, but it often represents a very superficial understanding of the Bible. And so we want to get super clear about our definitions and what we're saying, because social justice is the world's way of telling us what what's right and how we should treat others. Biblical justice is what God says is the right way to treat others. And so we want to keep our definitions at the forefront whenever we're talking to somebody about justice. So according to the world, social justice is fair and equitable distribution of economic benefits and opportunities. So that's our that's a basic fairly widely um, understood definition in the world of social justice, fair 
and equitable distribution of economic benefits and opportunities. Okay. And so let me make sure that I'm understanding. So fair and equitable distribution of economic benefits and opportunities. That's basically saying everybody should get the same opportunity, should get the same money, the same access to money. Do I have that right? Is that kind of how you would say it? Yeah, that, that you're on the right track there. It's it's kind of like saying we want everybody to end up in the same place. Mm-hmm. And so part of that is opportunities, but also another part of that is giving people help along the way to compensate so that they end up in the same place. So imagine you're running a race and you have a person in a wheelchair, a person with one leg, an obese person with two legs, um, an Olympic athlete, and you, the CrossFit woman. You're (laughs) all there at the starting line. So equal opportunity is we all start at the same starting line. Right, but equity right. or social justice says, no, we're going to stagger these people according to their abilities mm-hmm. so that everyone can cross the finish line at the same time. Okay. That's a fantastic visual image of, of what that looks like, because that was, that was my understanding too. And I think that's the part that kind of blew my mind a little bit when I started really understanding what they mean when they talk about you know, equity is another word that we hear a lot and it doesn't mean equality. Like it's two different things. They want everybody to, they want a guaranteed outcome. And, and I thought there are no guaranteed outcomes in life because we can't, we can't factor for how hard somebody's going to work. We can't factor for for effort. We can't factor for natural talent. We can't factor for, I mean, so many things in life that we can't factor for. And so it's like, we're trying to control a lot of things that are up to individual responsibility, not to society's responsibility. Yeah. And that's part of the confusing project of social justice, quite honestly. And that's why I said earlier, it's a lot of pretty words. It sounds really nice on the surface, but I, as a five foot middle-aged out of shape, uh, white woman is not, I have no business being on the basketball court with world-class athletes. Like that's never happening. And I don't have the talent and I've made a lot of life choices and here we are, and we're not going to be on the basketball court together. But truly that would be equity is that I would have a space on the basketball court if we were living in a truly equitable world. Yes. Okay. So interesting. And I think one of the things that's, that's confusing about it too, is the word justice, because justice is and we're probably going to get to this, uh, is a godly principle, right? This is a good thing. People, you know, there should be justice. We should get what we deserve, right? We There should be righting of wrongs. There should be all these things. But it's like you said, it's been co-opted, equivocated. And also, I feel like it is being used as an appeal to emotion. It's being, there's a whole appeal to guilt that goes along and appeal to pity. Like there's a lot of appeals to emotion around all of this that muddy the water as well. And that's another thing that we really have to get our thinking caps on when we hear this word jump into our classrooms or in our vocabulary or on social media, because the current world, the culture is telling us messages like, will we want a fair and compassionate system Mm -hmm. or let's end racism together or I'm for marriage equality or I'm for reproductive rights or sustainability. These all are slogans that we hear in the world that are under the umbrella of social justice. And so we have to start parsing out, now, wait a minute, what does this mean? And why is this not fair? Why is it not fair for two men to get married to each other? That's marriage equality. Well, the Bible has something to say about that. That's called homosexuality. So then as a Christian, we end up um, rooting for ideas that actually, according to the world, are social justice, but according to God's standard, are actually wickedness. And so this is the confusing space 
of social justice. Yep. No, that's super interesting. That's super interesting. Okay. So can you break it down? Like, give us an example of kind of what this, what this looks like and kind of how this plays out. Yeah, for sure. So let's think about um, the privileges that we might enjoy. Some people might enjoy the privileges of being raised by two parents, a mom and a dad. Um, They've always had food. They never had to worry about not having food. They went to a good school. Maybe they got a private tutor. If they struggled in school, maybe they went to um, higher ed to college. You know, their parents paid for them to go to college. They got to play sports or travel ball. That's very expensive. And then they that set them up to go to school or get a good job and buy a house. Okay, all of these things in our culture are called privileges. And shouldn't, then, then they'll ask the question, well, shouldn't everyone have access to all of these things? Well, that would only be fair. If we're running a race, We want to stagger where everyone starts so we all finish at the same destination. So we want everyone to finish with getting a good job and getting a house and having this much money. And if we don't have those things, then it's not fair. Okay. So this, these are the kinds of messages that the world is sending us. And they will point to that and say, that's an injustice. If a child is growing up like my friend Monique Dusan, growing up in the hood and her mom can't hire her a private tutor and she was raised by a single mother and um, they sometimes ran low on money and struggled with food and all of that. Well, that's not fair. So something must be done to correct that injustice. They should have access. Everyone should have access to those things. And if they don't, we call it discrimination. Well, the fact that Monique didn't have access to those things, something went wrong and it was discriminatory, but I maybe had access to those things, even though I was raised by a mom and and didn't have a dad in the home, but I had access to things and that was a privilege and somehow that was an injustice. And so then we get into situations of, well, now we need to redistribute resources or power, or both, so that everyone ends up in the same place. Now, that's super interesting. So how would you answer, so what is wrong with that? Like, what is wrong with the thinking behind, no, everybody should have access to the same things? Because that sounds like such a compassionate take, right? Like, right? So what's wrong with that? Yeah, that's great. And I think that then we start migrating into what does God's word say about these issues? Because if we just let our emotions get caught up into it and and the appeal to pity, which is another informal fallacy and is, in my opinion, very commonly used to kind of shape our thinking about social justice issues, um, if if we're just if we're not careful and we don't provide any interruption to that thinking it's easy to get sucked into that and to think well yeah what is wrong with that that sounds good and i should get involved i need to recognize my privilege i need to recognize my biases i need to listen to the stories of others and then become an ally or a social justice advocate for people and so that everybody can can ha- have access to all of the same things that makes sense. And when that really does make sense to us, then that's a a little bit of a yellow flag that we ought to wave in our minds of, hey, wait a minute, I might be being discipled by the world more than I realize. Mm. And so these ideas of equal kind of outcomes and that, that that is what is just and that unequal outcomes is unjust is an idea that is kind of a mixture of part the Bible and and compassion that we get from the Bible and the ideology of a man named Karl Marx. Ooh, okay. I was hoping we'd go there. Tell me about this. Yeah. So Karl Marx was, I think I would call him a historian 
and a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And I just recently read his most famous book, The Communist Manifesto. It's a very short book. It's a little hard to understand, but um, it was written in the 1800s. And he had the idea that we should get rid of all hierarchies and private property. So this would mean that there are no rich people and there are no poor people. Everybody has the same and all property belongs to the people, if you will. So nobody really owns anything. So think of this as like what we have now of of like the Uber world Mm -hmm. (laughs) of nobody owns a car. We just go on an app and a car comes to us and we don't have ownership of the car. Or now there's like Airbnbs are so prevalent and some people even rent Airbnbs or they travel around from Airbnb to Airbnb or, or, or you don't need to own a pool anymore. You can go on an app and find somebody with a pool and then book it and use their pool. And so it's almost like everything belongs to everybody in some weird kind of a way. Mm. We're all just using each other's stuff. Kind of like that, all right? Okay. Yep. But that there's there's no classes in society. So we don't see the uber rich and the uber poor. It's It's kind of right in the middle. And we're all just sort of sharing resources together, which again, sounds like a super compassionate way of taking care of the poor. Who who wouldn't be for that? We, we don't want poor people. That's sad, okay? But the problem is, is that this idea has some serious contradictions with the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so what the Bible says is that Poor people are just kind of, there's there's always going to be rich and poor. It's just part of the world in which we live. Yep. And our obligation as God's people, one of the ways that we display and we show to people that we belong to God and that we take our relationship with God seriously is that we help to care for the widow's the orphans, those who are treated unfairly. And so God says that he loves everyone. He loves the rich and the poor. But with the poor, he says if if people take advantage of poor people, then he will fight for poor people Mm -hmm. because he wants everybody to be treated fairly. And what fairly means to God is not about redistributing money. Mm. That's not what fair means to God. What fair means to God is that we treat everyone with dignity. Mm. That we, and this is how Christians have historically expressed justice, is because every human is created in the image of God and has inherent value and dignity and worth, Christians have built orphanages to help house orphans. Christians have built hospitals to help care for the sick. Christians have um, built ministries, like historically, like the Salvation Army, Mm -hmm. to help the poor and provide job training, okay? These are the ways that Christians historically have expressed God's justice in the world and his regard to... Um, treat everyone with dignity. So in our country, we want to treat people, what we mean by treat people fairly, historically, has meant in our country that we treat the rich and the poor the same. We don't um, have two sets of rules in our courts, for example, where here's the rules for the rich and here's the rules for the poor. And when that happens, when we do end up with two sets of laws for the rich and the poor, God calls that an injustice. Mm. That's what's wrong, is when we don't have equal standards for everyone. So just to recap, the Marx view, Karl Marx, or the world's view of what justice is, social justice, is that everyone gets the same resources. It usually is about money and power. Mm. From the biblical perspective, 
justice is about treating everyone with dignity and that we have one set of laws for everybody and everyone gets treated the same under the law, whether we are rich or poor. No, that's that's fantastic. So as we are hearing these messages, what are some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves to help us think correctly about this issue, about justice, about injustice, social justice, and all these things that we're hearing? How do we do this? Yeah. So the first thing we've got to do is slow the conversation down and ask the person that we're dialoguing with, like, what are your definitions and where do these come from? And what we have to do is really ground ourselves in the Bible and understand that justice comes from the very nature of God himself. It says in Psalm 89 that justice comes from the very throne of God. And so what we have to know is that there is actually no such thing as social justice. It's a made-up thing in the world where they have tried to co-opt an idea from the Bible. But more importantly, they're they're robbing God of his, his nature and character without giving him credit. So we have to know, first and foremost, justice comes from God. God's standard of fairness is not equal redistribution of wealth and power. There is no verse in the Bible that says everyone should have the same money or power and that it's wicked to have money, okay? What's wicked or unjust, according to God's standard, is if you steal money Mm. from someone else. But that's something a rich person can do. And it's also something a poor person can do. Yeah. Um, God is the one who distributes the money, the talents, even the family wealth, and he does it in an unequal fashion. God's concern is that we obey him with our money and resources. So we don't use our money for wickedness. We don't bribe government officials. Um, We don't engage in fraud. We don't engage in theft. We don't bribe judges as a a means of um, avoiding jail when we've broken the law. Instead, God wants his people to pay our workers fairly and generously. Uh, We use godly principles when we stay out of debt, when we share with others in need, And that we just know that everything we have is a blessing from God. This is how we think in a godly way about money and resources. Now, if I'm poor, I have the same responsibilities. I also have to obey God. How this looks for me as a poor person might be I don't covet what other people have. That's the 10th commandment. I don't steal from others. Instead, I work hard. I stay out of debt. I also share with others in need. And I trust God to provide for all of our needs. Um, and so when wherever we're out there in the world and doing our business, we want to promote the righteous ways of God. But we do this through a free will expression of our hearts because we know we belong to God. We don't do it because of government coercion that says, I'm going to take this money from this group of people and redistribute it to this group of people. That is not a biblical principle. And I think one of the things that gets missed in this whole conversation is human nature, right? Uh, You know, just understanding who we are as humans and also the importance and the necessity of personal responsibility and our choices. And, And, you know, and it's almost like the government or these groups are trying to override personal responsibility and personal decisions and the consequences of our decisions. When all throughout scripture, we're told over and over that we have to choose. We are to choose rightly. Like you said, regardless of our circumstances, we're held to account for what we, for our actions and for our heart. And so to me, that's just an interesting um, differentiation. So, you know, as you see it, Krista, what is the truth? What is the truth about this whole topic of justice? First and foremost, we need to know that God loves justice. Justice is part of his character and that he wants us to be like him. He wants us to emulate that character in him of justice. So how do we do that? We read the Bible. The Bible tells us 
to love our neighbor, but it also tells us very specifically how to love our neighbor. And when we love our neighbor according to God's rules, we are engaging in justice. So let me give you a few scriptures that people can look up and discuss together. I would read through Exodus chapters 22 and 23. Take a note there of all of the instructions related to how do we love our neighbor? How do we do that? Leviticus chapter 19 also has a lot of instructions for us to think about, and we can take those instructions from Exodus 22 and 23, Leviticus 19, and then we can look in the New Testament and say, look, a lot of these principles are repeated. So we know, hey, these are for us too. These are for God's people today. Matthew 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount gives us a lot of instructions for how to love our neighbor. But here's a pro tip. Jesus is mostly repeating things from the Old Testament. He might use different words, but it's the same principles. It's just repeated in a new context. Colossians chapter 3 has a lot of instructions. Ephesians 4 and 5 have a lot of instructions. So if we want to be just people, we've got to start in the Word of God. Finally, is don't make the mistake of doing things in the name of justice or social justice that are actually wicked. What the world calls um, abortion rights or reproductive rights is killing babies. That's not justice according to God's standards. So even though the, the phrase reproductive rights sounds nice, we don't want to fall into the, into the delusion and the mistake of promoting something wicked that God hates under the guise of justice. Same with marriage equality um, and, and a lot and some other things. And we just have to be very careful what we're advocating for to make sure we have a good biblical foundation for those principles. That's awesome. That's awesome. Krista, that I think you summed it up so well for us because um, you really talked through what culture is telling us and gave us something to think about a different way to think about it. Because right now, I don't think we're being taught to think about it at all. I think we're being told to feel guilty and therefore support this, do this, be mad about this, vote for this. You know, it's, it's an ultimate propaganda piece because they're trying to get you do think, believe, or feel something based on this certain messaging. And we have to go further. We have to say, okay, what are they really saying here? And what is the truth behind this? And you really sum that up well for us. Thank you so much. I'm happy to, to do it. I'm so glad for this conversation and I hope it helps the families. Yes, it will. So can you tell people about uh, where they can find you? Tell them, I know you work at, you've got Theology Mom and then you work with uh, Monique in Center for Biblical Unity, which I'm going to have her on here. Um, in a couple months, I'm getting to interview her. So that one is coming. But in the meantime, tell people where they can find you. Absolutely. You can go to theologymom.com and you'll find links to my YouTube channel, my Facebook page. I'm posting there quite a lot. And people can find, I think I have over 400 teachings now on my YouTube channel. A lot of topics about con making connections between theology and real life situations. Center for Biblical Unity, we're focused on a lot of the conversation about race and justice, but also all of the critical social theories and trying to help Christians know how to respond to living in a world that is really starting to, to be in an in a adversarial relationship with us and not liking us because we're Christians. How do we talk about it? How do we talk to people that disagree with us? How do we have those conversations and do it in a better way? Fantastic. Thanks so much, Krista. Okay, guys, I hope that was helpful. I hope that gave you a good, just a foundation for understanding what justice is, social justice, what the truth is behind it, and maybe just a different way to look at it. That's it for today. Remember, when you learn how to think, you will no longer fall prey to those who are trying to tell you what they want you to think. And it all starts with asking one simple question. Is that really true? I would love to hear from you. Do you have questions about fallacies and cognitive biases? Are you now starting to see and hear them everywhere around you too? Well, send them in. They just might get featured on the podcast. 
You can email them to me at think at filter through brain cell.com or you can connect with me on Instagram at filter it through brain cell. And if you want to be notified about when new episodes come out and all the things that we're doing, go to www.filter it through brain cell.com and sign up to receive email updates. I would love it if you would help us on our mission to teach society how to think well. Please subscribe, leave us a review, and share this podcast with people in your life. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to subscribe to the Theology Mom podcast and add your review. You can also follow Krista at Theology Mom on Facebook and YouTube. Join Krista for more theology adventures on the All The Things Show, co-hosted with Monique Dusan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.